to see the candy that I here to play if you don't come play with us. With any Disney attraction within the park, a storyline is created, a fictional background story to assist with the legend of the ride. Ken Anderson created such a story, though there were several to choose from. Uh, there were many ideas behind the Haunted Mansion when they were starting to come up with ideas. Um, one of the chief story, story men was Ken Anderson, and he worked on um, a couple different ideas for the Haunted Mansion, a couple different scripts and layouts, and one of them had to do with um, a Captain Bloodmere or Captain Blood, Captain Gore. There's a few different um, stories out there about the name, but essentially um, there was a, a sea captain and it was kind of a nautical theme. Um, to this point in time, there still is the weather vane on top of the Haunted Mansion that's a ship, kind of a callback to that original story, but not a lot of that rem remains. Many of Ken Anderson's early concept sketches portrayed the attraction as a walkthrough in which groups of visitors would be led by a mysterious guide. Well, Monsanto wanted to uh, participate at Disneyland with a new kind of an attraction that uh, was sort of like, um, you're, you're going to go through inner space. In other words, you're going to be shrunk down uh, till you're like the size of an, uh, an atom. So he had a candied apple on a stick just sitting on his desk and I just sort of picked it up and I says, yeah, you know, we could put people in a little pod and we could just sort of turn that around and uh, the people could look in any direction and we could control that. And yeah, we'll just stick it on a little stem and we'll put it on a chassis on this uh, endless chain of vehicles and now we can control uh, which way the vehicle rotates. Music is very important to the attractions at a Disney theme park and the Haunted Mansion was no exception. In the foyer, the song can be heard in the style of a funeral dirge on organ. In the loading area, an eerie flute with reverb, tubular bells, and a vocal wind track perform the tune. In the seance circle, many tracks were recorded, though the only musical cue used in that scene is a trumpet and percussion track. In the Grand Ballroom, a kooky organ was improvised by organist-composer Bill Sobranski. When the gates finally did open to the public on August 9, 1969, the public response was overwhelming, to the point that just one week after the mansion opened, Disneyland set an attendance record of 82,516 patrons. Good evening, foolish mortals. As you undoubtedly already know, there are so many wonderfully scary apparitions within the manor. So many, in fact, that it would be impossible to name them all. Fear not, mere mortals, for I can name a few that play a very spooky role inside the dusty mansion. One of the Haunted Mansion's most popular residents is Madame Leota. She is the spirit of a psychic medium who is conducting a seance in an attempt to summon the spirits of the dead. One interesting note, as guests exit the attraction, there is a little miniature figure beckoning guests to return. She is known as the Ghostess which is a combination of ghost and hostess. She is also known as Little Leota from cast members and Disney fans as she shares the same voice given from Leota tubes. Though Madame Leota and the ghostess are two separate characters.
In the early months of 1957, a new mode of transportation was being tracked within Tomorrowland, that of the Viewliner train. Walking along the tracks one day were Roger Brogy, Truman Woodworth, and Bob Gurr. We started this uh, attraction uh, called the Viewliner because laying a railroad is really uh, quick and easy. It's just rails and ties and ballast. And so I designed this cute little locomotive and little cars for that. While we were installing that ride, Roger Brogy, my boss, and Truman Woodworth, who was the manager of the park at that time, we were walking along the railroad track right along the side of this lagoon and uh, Truman Woodworth, we called him Woody, Woody says, you know, Walt's got everything in this park, but you know, he hasn't got a submarine. And it was, it was quiet. And then, by golly, within about a day, somebody phones me up and says, the charge number for the new submarine project is, well, it turned out that Roger Brogy heard this comment, saw the value of it, immediately went to Walt and said, let's build a submarine. Well, that fit in perfect with the uh, 1959 project where we were going to have the uh, Snow Mountain, which turned out to be the Matterhorn, and then we are going to add the uh, monorail and add the Utopia. But now we could do something with water because we're going to have a submarine ride. The submarines were built as a flat-bottom vehicle with an MAN 40-horse diesel engine. Each submarine was 52 feet long with individual 12-inch portholes for its 38 guests and contained a flow of air conditioning since every guest would eventually place their head against the glass to peer out. To further highlight the submarine attraction, Walt Disney sent out a casting call for mermaids. On Tuesday, September 8, 1998, several Disneyland cast members boarded one of the eight submarines for its last voyage. And so the lagoon remained emptied for guests to stroll by, looking into an empty lagoon and remembering an old journey of a Disney sub traveling the open sea. Until... In 2003, Neptune, one of the original submarines, was placed on the track at the old Submarine Voyage Station dock and tested. It was announced that the submarines would once again dive into the lagoon with a new title, Finding Nemo's Submarine Voyage. In 1958, while in the production phase of Disney's Third Man on the Mountain, Walt spent a great deal of time in Switzerland. One of the major features within this film was the real Matterhorn Mountain, which is situated on the border of Switzerland and Italy and stands at an impressive 14,692 feet and covered with snow. That was all it took for Walt. He sent a postcard to Vic Green, who was a part of his Imagineering team, that showed a picture of the Matterhorn, and he wrote only two words on the back, Build This. Walt was uh, going to have a big program for 1959. We were going to build a Matterhorn, we were going to build monorail, we were going to build a submarine, we were going to add a little motorboat ride, and also I had a new Utopia car uh, tracks. Uh, I worked on all of the, all five of those jobs. In the case of the Matterhorn, uh, it started mid-1958 after I had done a lot of preliminary work on the submarine ride. And the idea was that Walt had uh, been in Europe on the movie The Third Man on the Mountain and was quite taken with the shape of the Matterhorn. He had Fred Jerger, one of our models in the model shop, build a, a small-scale model of the Matterhorn with the idea that this would go on a place near the castle, which we called Snow Mountain, which were, had a big tower, 
uh, carrying the sky ride. Well, this meant that the sky ride is going to have to pass through the mountain with a, with a hole in it. Walt had his mind made up that we were going to have uh, bobsleds. Well, bobsleds are always like sled runners, and they run in a trough of ice, but, you know, you can't do that. So he said, well, we're going to do it with, a, with wheels. We're going to do it like a, uh, like a roller coaster. When Disneyland's Frontierland opened in 1955, guests could only explore the terrain via the Mark Twain riverboats or wagons characteristic of the Wild West. Stagecoaches, Conestoga wagons, Yellowstone coaches, and Surreys escorted visiting pioneers alongside mule trains. But however authentic, these forms of transportation were limited in their extent to offer a smooth, pleasurable experience for their riders. Dedicating seven acres and $400,000 as part of a major expansion during Disneyland's second year, Walt Disney introduced the Rainbow Caverns Mine Train as a new alternative on July 2nd, 1956. Designed and built under the supervision of Roger Brogy, the dark green locomotives with their large wooden cabs and small drive wheels were fashioned after the industrial steam engines of the early 1900s. Although the addition of brass bells, large box headlamps, and wood burner stacks added visual aids to their appearance, the mine trains were powered by electric motors and industrial batteries in lieu of live steam. Walt Disney himself had pushed for steam engines, but his idea had been overruled by Orange County officials. Instead, his trains used sand reservoirs for traction, as well as whistles and brakes that worked on compressed air stored in tanks within false boilers. When Disneyland first opened, we had uh, Western rides. Uh, we were using a stagecoach. We were having um, uh, like mule trains, some horses. Um, some of that wasn't so good because we didn't have a lot of high capacity. We were having some uh, problems with uh, animals, of course. You know, once in a while they'd turn over a stagecoach and they'd have a, a runaway horses. Um, we would have. Um, Sometimes the mule rides, the mules would act like mules and wouldn't go. So I think Walt had a good plan in his mind that by uh, going into 1956, we would actually take the whole area that was sort of, would be like the northwest corner of uh, Frontierland, and we would actually make it into like a nature's uh, wonderland type of a place. And the idea there was we should use a little railroad. So the idea came around very quickly because, you know, Walt always thought railroads. In 1959, all parts of this attraction were closed down until May 28, 1960. a $2.5 million, seven-acre wilderness preserve remodel of the former frontier land. $1.8 million expanded the mine train into the mine train through nature's wonderland. an elaborate and ambitious animation project praised for first propagating Disney's audio animatronics technology.
about four months after coming to Hollywood, my agent said, do you do any of the Disney characters? And I said, you know, well, you know, I've always played with them, and gosh, I can kind of do a Mickey Mouse, and Donald is tough to do. you got to do that thing in the cheek. And, I could kind of do that, but that's about all. But Gore's Goofy kind of fit right there in the wheelhouse. <laughs> and uh, out of about 1,200 people uh, uh, that were auditioned, they liked mine. And since January of 1987, I've been doing the voice for Goofy and Pluto and many others. Bill did not voice any characters for television again until 1992, when he voiced Goofy Goof in Raw Tunage and Goofy Goof and Aunt Goofelia in Disney's Goof Troop. Again, Bill's portfolio of expertise contains Goofy Goof, Pluto, and Horace Horsecollar. A Goofy movie was originally to be a Goof Troop movie with the same cast and characters. The original script didn't live up to uh, what Disney wanted, so they kind of scrapped that idea and they thought, well, let's just make it a movie about Goofy and his son. And they added more layers to Goofy. He's more of a caring father now than he was in Goof Troop. Uh, he's a little bit more serious. Um, and it, it was a great thrill. I got to work on it for like recording it about two and a half years and about 40 different days of recording because they'd record a scene, they'd say, no, that didn't quite work right. They'd rewrite it, we'd re-record it, and they just did it right. Well, the Carousel of Progress, uh, along with three other attractions for the New York World's Fair, was something that Walt wanted to do. Obviously, we had the uh, state of Illinois with the Abraham Lincoln figure, which uh, came in fairly late. We had the Small World, which started very, very late. We had the uh, Carousel of Progress, which had a fairly generous amount of time. But the first attraction that got started was the Ford Magic Skyway, because that was going to be uh, uh, quite an exhibit and have an entire new uh, ride system where the Carousel of Progress was uh, a lot simpler. It was a, basically a rotating uh, theater in which the center core of the rotating theater had uh, uh, five different uh, stages in it. In between each act, the song There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow by the Sherman Brothers serves as a bridge for viewers while they are transported to the next time zone. The song was written specifically for the attraction, but Richard Sherman also noted the theme song, Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, had a wonderful positiveness about it. In a way, it was Walt's theme song, very positive about the future. He really felt that there was a big, beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day.
When Walt Disney decided to build another theme park to supplement Disneyland after it opened in 1955, the Florida Project became one of his final dreams before he passed away in 1966. Nonetheless, construction on the planned complex flourished, and the Walt Disney World Resort had its grand opening in October of 1971. The light-hearted Pirates of the Caribbean attraction was never intended to be part of the Magic Kingdom due to concerns that it would not be exotic enough in view of Florida's geographic proximity to the Caribbean and New Orleans. An indoor-outdoor mine train roller coaster designed by Imagineer Tony Baxter and ride design engineer Bill Watkins. Baxter's concept came from his work on fellow Imagineer Mark Davis's idea for the Western River Expedition. A Western-themed pavilion at the Magic Kingdom designed to look like an enormous plateau and contain many rides, including a runaway mine train roller coaster. However, because the pavilion as a whole was deemed too expensive in light of the 1973 construction and opening of Pirates of the Caribbean, Baxter proposed severing the mine train and building it as a separate attraction. Disney's Mechanical Fabrication Group respectively took over to build the sets and three-dimensional figurines. The finished sets were erected in Disney Studios for approval by Walt Disney himself before they were shipped to New York and assembled in a show structure at the World's Fair site. Though the World's Fair building was less than pleasing to the eye, the aesthetic 120-foot tall Tower of the Four Winds designed by Rolly Crump stood in front to compensate and became a World's Fair landmark. The tower became a marquee and the whole ride echoed that design so it worked, Crump explained. Basically, we had started working on the World's Fair projects, and we had the Ford Pavilion, which I was working on some of the designs there. We had Mr. Lincoln, and we also had General Electric. And we had a lot of meetings. Walt was always in charge, and Walt was always the one that was coming up with, you know, what we were going to do. And one day, we were sitting in a meeting, and we'd really moved along. We had completely designed the Ford Pavilion. And Walt came in, and there was only, whenever we met with Walt, there was only like four or five of us. It wasn't a huge group. And he said, you know, there's another piece of real estate left up in the grounds at the World's Fair. And he says, I, I think we'd like...